Hello, my name is Stiley Hayward. I would like to welcome you to the Blessed Hope Ministry. We are a King James grounded family Bible study. These lessons are not to be a substitute for regular church attendance. Nightly I direct my family through the Bible by chapter and verse. We request you to join us and to study from God and His Son Jesus Christ. You may have permission to like, send, or encourage our studies with family or friends. Edification of what God has and what He desires in our life. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. You may use our studies, but I request that you do not abuse them. For YouTube videos, subscribe below for more videos. And place the thumbs up and leave a comment or email me. Thank you. Genesis chapter 9. And God blessed Noah, and God blessed Adam, and his sons. That's one thing you don't see God doing with, with uh, Adam's sons. And said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. There it is. There it is again. God has given us what replenish means when we saw it with Adam. We see it with Noah. So there was something in Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 that God said to Adam, refill it. Scripture with scripture. You don't really, most cases, you don't really need to run to a dictionary. You need to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We've got the definition. Most cases, the Bible will give you the definition. In some cases, it's within two or three verses. This, we have to go a few chapters. So, again, study here would be between Adam and Noah. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. So if you were to go up to a fish tank and all the fish take off in the back of the tank. If you're to be walking on a path and a rattlesnake starts curling up and starts shaking his tail. When you come to a dog that you don't know and he starts growling. It comes from Genesis 9 too. And this may be a new state between God with man and animals. Fear. In most cases, when an animal attacks you, it's because of fear. Even if a mama bear came up and caught you and ripped you to pieces, it might be the fear that her cubs are gone and she thought you were the enemy. When a dog bites, it's fear. When he growls. So now we have in animals the fear of man. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. All right, remember what we read about meat before in Genesis 2 and 3. It was herbs, plant food, fruits. Now, Genesis 9, 3, God has given to man the permission to eat meat. Living. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Okay? We're before the law. Lobsters, pork, if you like raven, <laughs> eagle. Every moving thing that liveth. There is no law now. Pretty much think around what tastes good for you. If it, if it tastes good, you like it, eat it. You want to eat snails? You're French. So, no me. Let me stay here now. From Genesis 9, 3. There it looks like there is no unclean animal now. So where did we get the clean animals and the unclean animals that God told Noah? And there's no law because there's no Moses. There's been no commandments given. It's all unclean. I mean, it's all clean. Excuse me. And God will set apart a particular people later on and say, listen, you're not going to be like them. 
your beard, your hair, your diet, your conduct, your one God, your one place of worship, you are not going to be in any way associated or to be thought of to be like those heathen. And then they say another thing is a lot of that food that is unclean for Israel, and I don't know. The species that are over there, they say, are poisonous or not good for you. But let's just take God says, you're going to be a particular people. Well, pork goes bad, extremely in, fast in heat. In bad heat. But there are a bunch of people who eat pork. So what we're going to do is, we're going to separate you from that pork. Now here's when religions get wrong, because, because now they'll tell you, we are on this side of judgment. Of the, of the flood. We are speaking to. Where, where are Hebrews? Where are Abraham? Where are. There are no Jews. There is no Abraham. There is no Hebrews. And God has given Noah and his three boys. Which we can trace our family roots. Back to them. Well, I don't know who. But we can trace our roots. To those three boys. And to Noah. And our family tree. And to those four males. God says, go ahead and eat whatever you want to eat. Now, what do you do with religions that put on you? There is no law. But, flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. So, God's telling us here something. If you were to have meat before the law, and in that meat of an animal, whatever animal it is, if it's still got the blood, that animal is still alive. And you shall not eat it. And there are particular menus out there. We are in a Gentile race here. There are no Hebrews. They are not under the law. And God has said, if that meat has blood in it, you're not going to eat it because it's still classified in the eyes of God as having life. And surely your blood, human blood, of your lives will I require. Uh-oh. Now, had this been written Genesis 3, early parts of Genesis 4, Cain would have been in trouble. But God says... Noah, I'm starting it all out again. I'm starting out with you and your wife, who has no name. Eve did not have a name with God either. And you got three boys, as Adam had three boys. I want to tell your boys, before I go any further in my Bible, and in the world, that if you think about killing any of your brothers, or any man, I'm going to requite that blood out of your hand. Don't you be like Lament there, whatever that story is. Don't you be bragging about you doing harm to somebody. Cain did not know this, but now God is proclaiming through his word. We are not in the law, but God has provided a law to Noah. And the law is, at the hand of every beast will I requite it. At the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I requite the life of man. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall he, his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Adam. He's going back to the creation. We are the image of God, body, soul, and spirit. And if you kill anybody, unlike Cain, you are now going to suffer capital punishment. This is the first law to Gentiles on this side of the flood. And it's not about your diet. Your diet, there's no law. Go ahead and eat whatever you want. Want to eat the apples? You don't want to eat meat? That's fine. You, you like that, that thing that's got horns on its head? And you, you can track it down and you can eat it? Go for it. If you like little bugs and, and put some chocolate on it, that's your privilege. But, if you kill any man... I'm going to requite the blood. And then when you run back to the story of Cain and Abel. Where there was no law. You run back to say hey. No one knows that I killed somebody. So I'm saying. No. The blood of Abel speaks to God. 
And Jesus said that when he was alive, between 30 and 33 A.D., there about. He says that the blood of Abel cries out. Hebrews says the blood of Abel cries out. And we will see later on the Lord tarry as we get there. We will see that blood, if it is shed by man, the earth is under a curse. And there's only one way to leave that blood from the earth being cursed. It's the person that slayed it has to be slain himself. So you cannot have a revival in America when you've got a nation of murderers that when they've killed somebody, in most cases they have pleaded guilty, are sitting in a correctional institute and not getting the death penalty. And you're treating them well with three meals a day and room and board and clothing. And you cannot expect God to bless a nation that goes against Genesis chapter 9. It's in the law. And as far as the church age, Paul says, listen, and I'm not quoting this completely, but in the book of Acts, he says, if I am guilty of the, of the, of the punishment, of capital punishment, I refuse not to die. And when you bring this up, when you bring up the law, and you bring up what Paul said in the book of Acts, and I've done this inside the American prison system, you get a big boo. You can preach politics and religion in a prison. I've done it. But don't you dare preach about capital punishment. You're going to offend somebody. Because everybody's innocent. Not in the eyes of God. Whoso has shed man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. You run yourself to Acts, I mean, you run yourself to Romans 13, 1 through 3. In the church age. And God calls the government his ministers when it comes to if somebody is found guilty of killing, it is your duty, it is your job to execute. This verse here, 9, 6. Goes right along to cross reference Romans 13, 1 through 3. In the church age. So, what is the first law? What is the first commandment? Thou shalt not eat of that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What's the next law? Well, you can eat anything you want now. If you really want to put it down. But the true law by God. The next one is not to eat a tree. A fruit of a particular tree. Now the law is. If you kill anybody. See the, the rebellion against the word of God. Against that tree of good and, good and knowledge and evil. Has already been done. It's you can't, do, you can't undo that. Until Jesus Christ comes. And washes us of all our sins. The Lamb of God, like the Lamb that God killed before Adam and Eve, take away the sin of the world. You can't do nothing now. And the next thing that God deals with is not taking that fruit. He takes the next sin that happens is those two boys, when one kills another, he says, okay, I'll take care of that law. You're not going to be able to plead innocence like Cain could have and had. So what is the first true law that God sets for mankind before there's even a Hebrew? If you kill somebody, another man sh shall kill you. So in other words, let, let's say for instance, let's say this is truly a type of Adam and Eve. Let's say, and it doesn't happen, but let's say Ham kills Shem. It doesn't happen, but let's say what happened. Not to drink the blood. So, word gets back to Noah. Ham has killed Shem. It would be up to now, if this happened and didn't happen, I'm sure. Noah or Japheth would have to execute Ham. Now it's a law. And you, be ye fruitful. And multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. That's what God told Adam. You know what the problem is? 
along came the enemy and threw some tares in there. Doe is righteous. And we don't know anything about his boys. One episode's coming up, but we're going to read what the Bible says and not apply anything else to it. And God spake unto Noah. He meant, what was, how would man hear God speaking? You ever wonder what that voice would have been? And to his sons. So here's God speaking to the three males and not the females. With him saying, Now remember, God spoke to Adam the authority and not Eve. And with every living creature that is with you, the fowl, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant. That's an agreement that God makes with man. I think there's seven or eight of them. Adam had one. Noah has one. Abraham's going to get one. It is something that God says to a particular man. A rule of government. A means of salvation. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Well, you say, well, we just had these big rainstorms come through America and the, the, the river flooded and people died. Okay, America. Did people in the country of Turkey die? No. Man, did you see those landslides in China and their people that they died in the waters? Did anybody die in Mexico from that? Well, no. What are you saying? There will be floods in America. Well, I don't know what you I don't know what you call it. It's North, South, Central America. And then you got Europe and Asia and Africa and our Antarctica. There will be floods in one or many of those countries, continents, states, provinces. But there will be no more flood that will take out the entire population. Like what just happened in chapter 7 and 8. And it's funny because it says the word all flesh. Now with that flood did God wipe out all flesh? Wasn't there eight people? Wasn't there uh, sevens of clean animals and pairs of unclean animals? So when you, when you go and say say all is all and that is all there is to be, there was eight people that survived, and God's talking to uh, four of them right now. And the animals are coming out of the ark right now. By the waters of a flood, a flood, there will be floods. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Isaiah 55, 54, verse 9. It may destroy the Mississippi area. It may destroy the coast of California. It may wreak havoc in Africa. But it's not going to touch the entire planet of Earth. And God said, this is the token. This is the proof. This is The Bible uses the word token as... All right, you want to borrow money from me? You give me some collateral. Give me something I can hold. A token also is something that, in New York, you can't get on the subway unless you have it. Well, they used to have tokens. It's something needed. It's proof that you have of something. Token of the covenant. All right, of this covenant. Which I, ha which I make between me, God, and you, the three men standing there, the human race, and every living creature that is with you, the animals are coming out, for perpetual generations. Now, this is interesting. This is important. You need to turn off your phones. You need to get on with, realize what's going on today, because now we are looking at something that's been perverted. 
by man in America and the world. Watch what God said. Perpetual generations. That is happening on July 8, 2017. As we just had a rainstorm come through Daytona Beach, Florida. And this happened, what we're going to read about. And this says 2348 B.C. And I don't know if I don't know if that's the date. It could be. If it is, it's been going around for 4,400 years. This covenant, this token, 4,000 years. And God said perpetual generations. And these people can't even explain what we're going to talk about. They'll talk about prisms and all that. Well... I do set God. I'm not. I'm not changing the Bible. I'm just putting the pronouns where they believe. Okay, may I not be changing the Bible. God, I do set my God's ball, my bow, in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Remember when we did Revelation chapter 4, verse 3, we saw that emerald round rainbow? And we, we commented on that, a green rainbow? That's God's rainbow. That is circling God's throne right now. He said, I will give you that rainbow. I will give you that bow in the sky. Now let's be careful with how we're using words here now. Because even I just did it. I did it purposely. I do set my bow, or is it a rainbow? It's a bow. In the cloud, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth, and it shall come to pass. When I bring a cloud over the earth for rain, that the bow, Revelation 4, 3, shall be seen in the cloud. Scientists have named it wrong. It's called a bow. And it's not really a rainbow because the rain has ended and God says, after the rain, I'll put my bow. So don't tell me it's the reflection of light in a prism. When you see that bow in the sky, those beautiful colors, that is God saying in chapter 9 in the book of Genesis that scientists don't believe. I will set that bow in the sky. And don't you think there's going to be a prison and all that? It's me doing it. And every time it rains, and every time that cloud ends the rain and comes through, that bow in the sky is mine. I put it there for a reason. I, God, will remember my God covenant, which is between me, God, and you, humans and every living creature and all flesh and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all the earth when you see that bow in the sky that is god saying in 2017 on july 8th that happened this afternoon in daytona beach florida now i remember that covenant i set with noah and those animals ham sham and japheth that reminded me of the worldwide flood, and that reminds me again, I am not ever going to drown that earth out again. Now, that's a memory of God. That is a state of God by God. And when you run to the church age, what is the Christian supposed to remember? The death, burial, and resurrection, according to the scriptures of Jesus Christ, called the Lord's Supper, the Communion, and that he's coming back. It reminds us that God is coming. Jesus is coming. And a world is just messed up and chaotic and trouble. You take the Lord's Supper, you take part of that, you're supposed to put your heart getting right, confessing your sin, getting with, right with God to remember that how Christ suffered. And died and bled for our sin. And he's coming. And then when God sees that bow in the sky, he says, I remember that flood. 
I remember those four men. I remember those animals. I ain't never going to do that again. So when you see that bow in the sky, you just thank you, God, for your mercy and grace. You haven't drowned us. And that you still remember. And at that bow, that bow in the sky, you remember Noah. How many kids in Sunday school today see her, that bowl and think of Noah? If they even know it has to do with Noah. I guarantee you, I know what churches are probably teaching about that bow. Their rainbow. There ain't nothing Bible. And the bowl shall be in the cloud. I will look upon it. God will see it. That I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. I will never, ever drown that earth completely out again. That's an everlasting covenant. That is as sure as when I die, I am going to heaven by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is sure. <coughs> that everlasting covenant that happened this afternoon in Daytona Beach, as sure as a man that rejects Jesus Christ, he goes into the lake of fire that burneth for all eternity. And then once the earth is gone and the heavens are gone, they're rolled up, they're burnt up, the elements are, are, are just, as Peter says, when we are raptured before that happens, when we are taken to heaven before the tribulation, and we stand before that God and the throne in Revelation 4, we look up and there's the bow. And it'll have nothing to do with rain, it'll have nothing to do with storm, it'll have to be, there's the glory of God encircling you. Some people look for Oz. I look for God. There's the there's the emerald bow. I'm not looking for an emerald city. I'm looking for the for the emerald bow. So go ahead, you know the the the, the multicolors. Go ahead, you can steal the rainbow because that's not what God called it. There's really no perversion because God said it's a bow and. There it is. I bet you the modern Bible say rainbow. And God said to Noah, this is the token of the covenant. And you get to see it right there. It's in the sky. He says, look, look, Noah, see it? This is the token right there. You see it, Noah? Of the covenant, which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. It's not raining no more. You see that? You see it, Noah? Every time you see that, and you're going to be long dead, your sons are going to be long dead, and, and 4,000 years later, that, that's see that? I'll remember. God has got some memory. He's got a greater memory than I, I have, because the Bible says he can call all the angels by name. He knows them. And there's only one thing that God cannot ever remember, and this is interesting. He cannot remember my sins that are under the blood of Jesus Christ. And if I do not have sins under the blood of Jesus Christ, and I am posed as a sinner, when those sins are judged at the judgment seat of Christ and turned to ashes, at that point, God will never remember them anymore. Never. That's the only thing I think God can ever forget. Ever. Or maybe a lost man's name that when he goes off in the lake of fire or into hell. He was just a rich man. We don't know his name. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Cana. Now, this race of people do become the Africans. All right? You trace their root. They were not supposed to go to Cana. They were supposed to go all the way south to Africa. That is their land. And God drove them out of the land that belonged to the Hebrews. These children of Ham end up in the, in the land where Israel comes in and then takes them over. Half wittily and lets them stay. But now, here we go. Uh, is Ham colored? I don't know. Is Noah color? Is his wife colored? I don't know. I can tell you when the world had to press one for English. I can show you that in the Bible. But I cannot tell you where the colored man and the brown man 
and the white man came from. And see, when we look at that, you know, Ham, the colored man, how bad he is. No, 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 let's look at it. Japheth would not have been white. The children from Adam were brown. Adam means red-brown. The predominant color of man, until whenever the colors change, which I don't know when, are the color of the Jewish people today, reddish-brown. Jesus was reddish brown. He was not white. And he was not colored. He was a Jew. Jews are brown. When did they become colored? How did they become colored? Why did they become colored? I don't know. Some run it back to Cain with that mark. And I really don't believe that. I don't have enough scripture on that. Some things I'll say, like I said, the dates, they could be well. People studied it out. Possible, not possible. Man's color? I don't know. You know what? I don't really care. I'll witness to a colored man, to a brown man, to a white man, just as much as I witness to anybody. I've got people who are, who are black skin are my friends, and brown skin is my friends. And white. So the sons were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. Those are the people who are not supposed to be in that land. That's the note. When Israel goes in that land, they're the children of Ham. These are, I don't know why he would name his son after pork. I don't That's a weird name, Ham. Shem is the line of Jesus Christ. Is he brown? I don't know. These are the three sons of Noah. Of whom then was the whole earth overspread. Now here we go back with Adam and, and Noah. I keep wanting to say Moses. If you were to possibly do your family tree, I can tell you right now. I can tell you three points on your family tree you would be 100% correct on. And some, maybe not even so. If you were to know the true identity of your mother and father. Some people don't. I'm not trying to pick it up but some people but even that one it is questionable because you may have been adopted and the papers may be sealed so you really some people don't really know you can trust your your heritage to Noah and whoever his wife's name is right there Genesis 9 19 God says that's where your family tree is your family tree came out of a wooden ark. Isn't that interesting? And then you can trace your family tree again, 100% to Adam and Eve. Who had a problem with trees. For a family tree. And when you see the genealogy of Mary to Jesus Christ, in Luke chapter 3, it traces all the way back to Adam, the son of God. And you'll find Noah here. And Noah began to be a husbandman. Come on, do you see it? Do you see Adam? And Mary stood at the sat at the garden weeping and crying. And she starts talking to a guy. She's supposing him to be the gardener. That's interesting. Noah... We did not know, well, what was Noah's occupation before the flood? We don't know. We have no idea. Now he picks up, he's a husbandman. Adam was a husbandman. Jesus Christ was thought to be a husbandman. And he planted a vineyard. Well, gee, you know what the vineyard is, the type of the Bible? It's the type of Israel. A man went and planted a vineyard. He put a press in the middle of that vineyard, built a wall about, and went off to a far country. And I don't have the note here. Isaiah speaks about the parable of the of the vineyard. And he drank of the wine. And was drunken. This is the first intoxication of the Bible in the man called Noah. Who was right and just in the eyes of God. And we don't know if he knew what was going to happen. Or we don't know if he did not know what was going to happen. We don't know if people got knew this stuff would make you drunk, intoxicated, and that was part of the violence. 
Or did Noah just plant this vineyard and all of a sudden, boom, what on earth happened to me? But this is the first place it shows up in the Bible, and I watch next. And he was uncovered within his tent. The first intoxication in the Bible also has to do with nudity. There it is. Adam and Eve were naked, and they were not ashamed. Noah's drunk, uncovered, and he's going to have shame. Noah had a problem with a fruit in his life called a grape. Adam had a trouble with a fruit in his life, and we don't know what that fruit is. Now, I'm going to tell you, with the, with the scripture and the study that has followed, I would 50-50, I would say that that fruit that Adam had with trouble was, was a grape. Now, some people may not believe me on that, but I've seen the evidence, I've seen the scriptures, and there's really one fruit in the world that will get you in all kinds of trouble. Proverbs 23, 29. And that man will keep running back to it after they act like an idiot. So the first place of drunkenness showed up in the Bible, and yet, the New Testament doesn't say anything about drinking. It says the pastor or the elder is to refrain from drinking. The deacon, let him have a little wine. As far as a, a stomach problem, take a little wine. But as far as the Bible's placement of intoxication, it involves a great trouble for a man that is right with God. And we will hear no more of Noah after this. And when Adam sinned with his fruit, we heard no more of Adam after that. Isn't that interesting? And Ham, the father of Cana, saw the nakedness of his father. So he's naked. Uncovered and naked. Adam and Eve again were naked, and there was no shame. And told his two brothers without. His, his brothers without, they were nowhere in the area. They were gone. He goes up to his brothers and says, Hey, listen, I've seen Dad. He's in his tent. He's naked. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Now, why would they go through all this if he's wearing short shorts? Some people say it is not really truly nakedness. They turned around and looked the opposite way and walked backwards. And when they thought their father was in view, they dropped the, the clothing and then left. And Noah woke from his wine. Oh boy. He's sober. And knew what his younger son had done unto him. What did he do unto him? He knew what his younger son had done unto him. Doesn't give us very much information, does it? Anything else we would really have to speculate. And we could throw verses out there, and but as far as what God has told us, Ham saw his father was naked. He went to his brothers and told them. His brothers took action, and he didn't do action. And he said, Cursed be Cana. Well, there's a trouble right there. Cursed be Cana. We're talking about Ham. Like I said, yeah, chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his son. So you cannot reverse a, a blessing upon, a, you, yeah, you cannot reverse a blessing to whom God is blessed. So it is passed on to his children. Now, yes, the Bible says that Ham, in the land of Ham, was Israel. That's Egypt. Yes, curse be Cain, a servant of servants shall be, shall he be unto his brethren. Yes, the Hamites, the Canaanites, are proven to be slaves of the brethren, even slaves of their own 
kindred. And yes, they are colored. But when they became colored, I don't know. The Bible scripture shows Ham's descendants. I don't know Ham. I don't know. They are the colored men of Africa. And yes, they are the servants. They are the slaves. History proves that unless you rewrite history. Why were there slaves in America? Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Well, who was the owner of the slaves of America? European. Who is the European? Jacob. That's Bible. And if you want to, I'm not saying slavery is good. I'm not proven of slavery. But when you want to get angry with slavery and you want to go in abolishment and you want to go anti-Bible, anti-God, you are in big trouble. Because it is recorded in Genesis 9, verse 26, that he said, Blessed be the Lord God. Oh, wait a minute. Verse 25. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. That is established by Noah, their father. Recorded by the Holy Spirit. I didn't say it. Noah said it. Noah looked at his son and said, My grandchildren of you are going to be slaves. Noah said that. And God recorded. That's what you said, Noah? Okay, I'll record it. And the black man has been slave all around the world. To Japheth and to Shem. And even to his own Cana. But the world forgets that Israel, Shem, were servants to the Africans in the book of Exodus. But let's move on. He shall, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. That's the line of Jesus Christ. I got a note here covered. And Shem means, now get this, you ready for this? Drum roll, please. What is the meaning of Shem? What does his name mean? It means name. N A M E. And when you check out Acts 4 12, there is no other name given amongst men whereby you must be saved. From Shem will become the name. And thou shalt give birth, and I'm not quoting this verse quick, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. So let's restart the population of the world in the line of Jesus Christ, the first descendant of Jesus after the flood of the eight people in the world, and from his kindred comes name. Not a servant of servants, not the European, as Hollywood would think you to believe, he comes from a name. And mark your Bible every time you see the word name in reference to God or Jesus Christ. Mark it and you'll be amazed. That the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem and Cana shall be his servant. Oh, look, we're running right back to Cana again. The book, the beginning part of Exodus was improper going against what Noah said. It was supposed to be the other way around. According to what Noah said. Dad said, Shem, you're going to have your your nephew. Yeah, your nephew and his descendants are going to serve you. You got that? And then we get in the story of Exodus. It's, it's been turned around. God shall enlarge Japheth. So Japheth is the one that gets into the ships. And ventures worldwide when you learn in school. If you still learn in school today. The explorers. I know people are going to be offended at me. But I don't care. You have not ever studied a black man getting in a ship. And going to find somewhere anywhere in the world. 
He is not listed among the explorers of the world. Now, he may have been on the ships as a servant, as a cabin boy, but as far as the leader of an expiration, he, it's not him. It's Japheth. Japheth is the first one that went into outer space. Columbus, coming to the Bahamas, was of Japheth. Cornelius, I'm not Corn, uh, whatever those men's names are. I don't care. The European. Gosh, I don't, he moves out. The Roman Empire moves out all over. Babylon moves all over. Check out the maps. How were they started? How they spread it, spread it, spread it out. And he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. He's moving east to west. And I got to say, when Jathan came to America, and when he moved to America, he stepped into the tents of the Native Americans who are Shemites. That would be the only really place you would probably see America, and here it is, the pilgrims. And the, and the Shemites helped Japheth. They survived the winters, and they had a Thanksgiving with God. Boy, is that gone today. Because when we have a Thanksgiving with God today, we pass the pigskin, and we go out getting ready to go shopping at 10 o'clock at night, all the way to 5 o'clock the next day. Japheth is the adventurer. Cana is the servant. And Shem is the religious. He's the one that's got all those oriental religions. You, you bow your knees. You come back as a cockroach. Uh, you know, you, you worship your, your emperor as a deity. You are strong. You are bold. For You will die for your emperor. That's Shem. I'll show you what America is when it comes to religion. That That is not Jesus' job. Seven-day Adventism. The Mormonism. The Charismatics. The Jehovah Witnesses. The Church of Christ are all the fruits of religion in America. And they have nothing to do with God and Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholic Church is built upon Japheth. The Methodists are built upon Japheth. The Lutherans are built upon Japheth. The, uh, the Church of England built upon Japheth. And none of, those, none of those are God approved. Now the Christian, the true born again Bible believing Christian, what is his faith based upon? It's based upon Shem, Jesus Christ. The Bible is Shemitic. It's Hebrew. So we have a, a, a book in our Bible called Hebrews, and Japheth wants to go run to Hebrews and claim the promises for himself. But the Roman Catholic Church is wrong for doing that when they claim to take the promises of the Old Testament of the Jews. But Japheth can do it for Hebrews. No, Japheth is not the religious one. That is Shem. Japheth makes medicine. He makes bombs. And he figures out how to kill his brothers. And if he does, he's going to have to die by the hand of his brothers. Cain is not going to kill anybody unless you put him in a big city and give him rights. Sorry. And Shem ain't going to kill anybody because he's trying to get into the inner focus of life and, and the meaning of life and the yoga and, and all that. And when they are in India, you don't step on a bug. When you're in the Korea, you don't, you don't kill a fly. When you're in Japan or, or those countries, those island countries, you respect every life. That's Shem. Now, he may be wrong. Most of the Shemites may be wrong on their doctrines. But there's worship in Shem. And that's, we're going to finish and we'll go to one more verse. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Cana shall be his servant. So Cana is going to, is going to be servant to all his family. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. 
Now we run back to Genesis chapter 5. Adam. Adam lived so many years, beget this son. And then he lived after that, beget sons and daughters. And all the days of Noah were 950 years. And he died, just like Adam. Now, John chapter 1, as far as Shem. John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1, and we'll close. The line of Shem. And read Matthew 1 and read Luke chapter 3 on your own. The line of Shem. Let me get to John chapter 1. The pages stick together. We read about Jesus Christ and say, where can we start? Verse 8. He was not that light, John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that light, Jesus Christ. That was the true light which lighteth every man and cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, Genesis 1, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, Jesus, and his own received him not. Verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, and the glory as of the only begotten Son, begotten of the Father, full of grace and true. And you run his genealogies back in Luke, and you run his genealogies back in Matthew, you find that he comes from Shem. And he has a name. The name Jesus Christ. Look how wonderful we are. We are in Genesis, and we see Jesus. It is so great.